All right, here we go. This is part two of chapter two, which is basic periodic table stuff. So let's draw a rough little sketch of the periodic table here. So this is Castle Mendeleev, that's what I like to call it. So I think this is one of my better drawings, actually. So here we go, it goes down here to here, then kind of down here to here then goes up like this, over, up, up. Yep, that's beautiful. The periodic table is basically split into a couple of main parts. So here are the stairs, right? Wow, that is horrible, but that's okay. There's the stairs. We know the stairs are, well, I'll talk about those in a second. Everything to the left of the stairs in general are metals. In the middle, we have our transition metals where we have to use our Roman numeral stuff for names. Up here are non-metals. And then this section over here, hopefully you know, are the noble gases. They are special gases because they have a full outer shell of valence electrons, so therefore they don't react. They're noble, they exist as single atoms by themselves. And then the stair steps are the metalloids. So the metalloids have some properties of both metals and non-metals. And if we would zoom into those, let me zoom in for you. Look at that. That is so fancy. I think that's something like this. So the metalloids are boron. Underneath boron. Oh, wow, this isn't very accurate. That's okay. I'm just going to list them out. Antimony, silicon, polonium, tellurium. Oh, the screen. So those are the metalloids. Nothing that you really have to memorize, but it's just good to know which ones are the actual metalloids on the periodic table. And then we have to know our different properties of metals and non-metals. I would probably memorize these. We know that metals are malleable, which means they bend without breaking. We did a lab freshman year where you looked at properties of metals and non-metals. Metals like to form positive ions, which means if they become more positive, they actually like to lose electrons. They lose electrons. Uh, metals have luster, aka they're shiny. Here's the lose electrons for the form positive ions, kind of the same thing. And in general, they have three or less valence electrons. Valence is spelled V-A-L-E-N-C-E. -E. I just usually do V-E minus. A valence electron is an electron on the outermost part of the atom. Nonmetals are basically the exact opposite of metals. Metals are malleable. So nonmetals are brittle. Metals form positive ions. So nonmetals form negative ions. Metals are lustrous. So nonmetals are dull. Metals lose electrons. You guys get it. Gain electrons. And usually nonmetals have five or more valence electrons. Because if you think about it, they want to take the path of least resistance. So if metals only have three valence electrons, it's easier to lose three, two, or one electrons than gain five. Because so the ultimate goal is to have eight. Nominals, since they start with at least five, it's easier to gain one, two, or three than lose five. Hence those properties. Our different groups have different charges. So we know that group one, I will start a little chart. How about that? Group one has a charge of plus one, which means if you lose an electron, it becomes a positive one. Group two has a charge of plus two. Group 13 has a charge of plus three. Group 14, we're gonna skip. Group 15, all of those going down the group or the column have a charge of negative three. Group 16 have a charge of negative two. Group 17 have a charge of negative one, and group 18 are the noble gases, so they have zero. They have no charge. 
When I get the group 14, they have four valence electrons. It's always the second number that tells you how many valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because they have four valence electrons, they can lose or gain, so plus or minus four. They can lose or gain four electrons. Why are charges important? Well, because to form a compound, all compounds must have net zero charge. This is how you determine how to make a good compound. All compounds must have net zero charge. And the first type of bonding we usually learn is ionic bonding. We're into like week seven of CP Chem now. Ionic bonding is a metal plus a non-metal. Or a cation, because the cation, I always think of the T as a plus sign, plus an anion. The way I remember anion is the non-metal, well, first of all, these are positive, these are negative. Uh, you can think of it as a negative ion. Some people think my handwriting that says onion. Anion, some people think my handwriting looks like onion. Sorry, I got paused there. Somebody came in. Um, they make you cry, so they're negative. So cation is the metal, positive. Anion is a non-metal, negative. So a couple ways to do these. Um, if I have calcium, bonding with nitrogen, I can just write their charges from the periodic table. Calcium is in group number two, so a charge of plus two. Hopefully I've given you a periodic table by now. Nitrogen is in group, thir uh, group 15, so it has a charge of minus three because it has Group 15 has five valence electrons, so they want to gain three electrons, giving it a charge of negative three. And all I have to do is just cross the numbers down. So the three comes down to calcium, Ca3. The two comes down to nitrogen, Ca3, N2. And the name of this, when you name these, is the first name is just calcium. And the last name turns into an IDE ending, calcium nitride. Calcium nitride. Um, a way to do this um, with your valence electrons, if I had like sodium, sodium has a one valence electron. Chlorine is in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons. You fill, this, these are called Lewis dot structures. You fill them top, right, bottom, left, top, right, bottom, but chlorine only has seven. To show the transfer of electrons in an ionic bond, you draw an arrow. So sodium has lost this electron, has a full shell, chlorine has gained. This is now NaCl. If you wanted to prove it, well, sodium is a plus one, chlorine is a minus one. That's a perfect match. So there's nothing to cross. So that is ionic bonds. If you wanted to do one a little bit more difficult, you could do something like aluminum and sulfur. Aluminum has three valence electrons, because it's in group 13. Sulfur has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I would suggest pausing it now and trying to do this on your own. So pause, try to do this on your own, see if you can get the formula for aluminum sulfide. So here we go. I'm gonna transfer one electron to sulfur here. Transfer two electrons to sulfur there. Sulfur is now happy, but now aluminum only has one valence electron, making it even more reactive. So I need another sulfur. One, two, three, four, five, six. Give this electron to sulfur. Now this aluminum is happy. It got rid of all of its valence electrons. But now sulfur is even more reactive because it has seven and it wants to have eight. So now I need another aluminum. One, two, three. Give another electron to sulfur. This sulfur is happy, but now I have two more electrons, and at this point you're thinking, oh, 
this will work because we know that sulfur has six valence electrons. So sulfur can accept to give one to sulfur here, give one to sulfur there. Everybody's happy. Or the shortcut, aluminum is a three plus, sulfur is a two minus, crisscross, and you get Al2S3. Two aluminum, three sulfur, Al2S3, that is aluminum sulfide. Aluminum sulfide. Um, so to summarize our binary, which means two ionic compounds, I feel like I'm going off the screen, binary ionic compounds, these are made of two elements, which would be a metal and a non-metal, ionic the word ionic means transfer, usually shown by an arrow of electrons. And these always end in IDE. These always end in IDE. So that is your binary ionic compounds. Whenever you throw in transition metals, it's the same thing for the most part, but now you have to deal with Roman numerals. So, transition metals to review are from group number three on the periodic table, from group number three to under the stairs, but not aluminum, because we always know aluminum is a three plus. So it's from group three to under the stairs, but not aluminum. The thing about transition metals is their charges can vary. So their charges aren't necessarily set as one thing. There are three exceptions that you need to know. And I would write these in on your periodic table. On zinc, on your periodic table, I would write a plus two right on the square on zinc because zinc only forms a plus two. Silver always forms a plus one, and cadmium always forms a plus two. So on those three elements on your actual periodic table, write a plus two, plus one, and a plus two on those so you don't forget. So if I was going to do a formula for one of these, and I saw something like this, I see iron two oxide. The nice thing is it's actually saved us some work. So iron, here's my charge, it has to tell me the charge is a plus two and I get that from the Roman numeral. I'm going to look up oxygen group 16 so that is a negative two. So I have a two plus, a two minus, so that is a perfect match. So this is just FeO. What about tin four, tin four sulfide? If I was going to write a formula for that, I would know that tin SN is a four plus. Sulfur is a two minus. I'm going to crisscross. That gives me SN2S4. And now that we have larger subscripts, larger charges, you have to reduce. So this would not give you the point. You have to rewrite that as SNS2. That would be your formula for tin four sulfide. We never show ones because ones are assumed just like in math. You don't write ones as a coefficient. If you're going to write the name, you'd have to work backwards. So if I had something like this, C U S, I'm going to uncrisscross. There's nothing here, so we assume it's a one. So a one is going to come with the sulfur and become a one minus. A one is going to come to copper and become a one plus. This is the difference on these transition metals. I have to check the charge of the anion and make sure it wasn't reduced. So I'm going to go to my periodic table, 
and I'm going to look at sulfur, and I see it's in group 16, and sulfur should be a minus 2, which means I have to actually multiply this by 2. I'm technically, I'm unreducing it right here. But we know in math and also in chemistry, if I multiply one side by 2, I have to multiply the other side by 2. So now I have a 2 plus, a 2 negative. That's good to go. Okay, I got kind of interrupted again, but that's okay. Um, SNS2, oh, unreducing. So now I know that copper is a two plus, and that, that's where I get my Roman numeral. So this is copper, two sulfide. That would be the name of this compound. The only other wrench you can throw in here are polyatomic ions. So polyatomic ions are the groups on the back, which you will have to memorize, but by the time we're to the AP test, you'll have them all memorized anyways because we'll have used them so much. So on the back of your periodic table, polyatomic ions are groups of three or more attached. So this is the back of your periodic table. Let me show you what that looks like, just to make sure I have this. Here we go. Let's walk all the way to the back of the room. Oh, that's only the front of the periodic table. What in the world? How does that even happen? Not a very good here it is. This is actually what you're going to get. So, here's my periodic table that you guys will have. On the back are all of my polyatomic ions. So it's a group of three or more. These act as a one charged group. And you just keep the name. Unless it's an acid, which we'll talk about that in a second. But these are still ionic compounds we're talking about. So polyatomic ions. So if I have something like this, Ca, NO3, parentheses, 2. The name of this is, Ca is calcium. I would look up NO3. These are alphabetical. NO3 is nitrate. So this is just calcium nitrate. Um, same thing for Roman numerals. If I had something like this, nickel 2 permanganate. Nickel 2 permanganate. I would write the charge of nickel. So nickel is a, right here, plus 2. I'd write this, the formula for permanganate. So go in the back. Permanganate is MnO4 minus 1. MnO4 minus 1. Not a perfect match, so I crisscross. That becomes Ni MnO4 2. Don't make that mistake. I don't want 42 oxygens. I want 2 of the whole group. So whenever the subscript on the group is anything but a one, you have to put a, a parentheses around there because I like to call this keeping the happy meal together. I have two of the whole group. So that's with our polyatomic ions. Pretty much the same idea as what we were just doing, but you just have groups in the back. Okay, what if we have two nonmetals? We're flying here. Two nonmetals. If I have two nonmetals, then we have covalent bonds. And I like to say covalent is sharing, because caring is sharing, and so is covalent. So covalent bonds are sharing of electrons. Usually we show sharing by circling. So for these, 
we use prefixes. These are the easiest ones to name, all right? And for prefixes, put in parentheses, mono can only be in a first name. So mono can only be in a first name. Oh, that's wrong. Mono can only be in a last name, duh. All right, mono can only be in a last name. So what would one of these look like? Well, we do our diatomic elements. So oxygen is one, two, three, four, five, six, with another oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. The thing with these is I can't give an electron from this oxygen to this one because that doesn't help this one. But I could share a pair of electrons here, and now this oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I could also share a pair of electrons here, and now this oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so does this one. And now I have made a double bond. So if I was gonna draw this, it'd be oxygen double bonded to oxygen with lone pair here, lone pair here, lone pair here, lone pair there. So this is O2, O2. Nitrogen is a little different. Nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. If I have two nitrogens, one, two, three, four, five, maybe pause and try to figure out what this would be. So pause. Okay, nitrogen, gonna share a pair here, gonna share a pair here, and share a pair here. I want to share three pairs. So this is a triple bond with one lone pair on each, and that is N2. And you can do that with multiple things like CO2, anything like that. So speaking of CO2, if I was gonna name it CO2, on the back of your periodic table, you have your molecular prefixes. If you need to look at this, you'll have these. You probably already know this anyways. But my first name is just carbon, because that's carbon. My last name is two, so that is dioxide, carbon dioxide. If this was CO, this would be carbon monoxide or carbon monoxide. And if I had something crazier like P2O7, that is diphosphorus because there's two phosphorus, seven oxygens, heptaoxide. Diphosphorus heptaoxide. Last type of names is acids. This is also um, kind of a type of ionic bondings, but I kind of make them their own things. For acids, what you have to know is hydrogen H plus is always the cation. Hydrogen is always the cation. And I just put these into two, two categories for acids. For acids, I have without oxygen and I have with oxygen for my acids. So let's just jump into one. HCl, you would agree, has no oxygen. I would name HCl as hydrochloric acid. And the nice thing is, is whenever there's not an oxygen, it's always just hydro something ick acid. It's always hydro something ick acid. So if I had H3N, this is just hydro nitric acid. If I had HSCN, okay, now I've determined that this must be a polyatomic group on the back. So I'd look up at the back. I would see SCN is here, that is thiocyanate. So this would be hydrothiocyanic acid. 
And if I wanted to work backwards to write the formula, if I had something like this, if I had hydro sulfuric acid, hydro sulfuric acid, well, I know that H plus is always the cation. So I have H plus and Sulfuric must have came from sulfur, which is from group 16, which has charge of minus 2, crisscross. So this is just H2S. With oxygen, a little bit different. With oxygen, I remember two statements. The statement number one is I ate something icky. I ate something icky. And look how I wrote that. All you have to remember is for the first part, if, you, if it ends in eight, this is most likely a group on the back. The ending is changing to ick. There's no more hydro. There's no more hydro. And also, you are safe with us at night. So notice that I spelled us a little bit weird, O-U-S-I-T-E. Those are those changes. Those are those ending changes. So if it ends in it, it changes to us. That's pretty much it if it has oxygen. So if I had this, if I had H3PO4, I would look up PO4 on the back because I know that if it has oxygens on the back, PO4 is phosphate. So phosphic doesn't sound great. So phosphate changes to phosphoric acid. That's it. Um, if I had something like this, sulfurous acid, and I wanted to write the formula, I know that sulfurous had to come from sulfite, which is SO32 minus. When I write the formula for this, I know it's always H plus one. I have SO32 minus. I'm gonna crisscross, and that gives me H2SO3. And that is it for acids. That's it for acids. I think I have enough time to finish this. So the last thing you're gonna, you're gonna do is make a little chart. So I want name, symbol, atomic number, mass number. This kind of reviews everything we've done. Number of protons, number of electrons, number of neutrons, Oh, wow, I'll have to zoom out for this. Valence electrons, Lewis, and charge. Wow. It got way bigger than I thought it would be. Name, symbol, atomic number. I should have used a ruler for this. Mass number, number of protons, number of electrons, number of neutrons, Valence electrons, Lewis dot structure, charge. Can I get a ruler really quick because that's looking sloppy. Oh, rulers. Sorry. You guys copy that down while I'm looking for this? I have three examples for you. I'll make this look pretty. So this will take room for one. Two, three. 
So on the first row, I'm just going to give you the mass numbers 14. I have six protons and four valence electrons. On the second row, I'm just going to give you the symbol, which is 19, 9, F. And on the last row, I think I'm going to give you mass number of 23. Number of protons is 11. So you should be able to fill out all of this, all the rest of the row based on what I gave you. So pause, fill them all out, and check your answers in a second. Okay, both of you paused. Math number 14, proton six. Protons is always gonna be this, well, not always, but most of the time gonna be the same as electrons. So, I'm trying to think if I messed up here. Um, actually, I wanted this to be also say 10 electrons. Shoot, I'll have to tell you guys before you watch this at the very end of part two, I made one mistake because that, that's kind of a game changer. Okay, so hopefully you fast forwarded and now you would pause and do it. Okay, here's the right answers. Six protons, six electrons, Mass number 14, 14 minus six is eight for my number of neutrons. If I had four valence electrons, this is, well, first of all, what is this? Six protons, this is carbon. So this is gonna be carbon dash 14. The mass number goes in the name. Symbol is carbon 14 for my mass number, six for my atomic number. Atomic number is six, because it's the same as the number of protons. Four valence electrons, so carbon, one, two, three, four. Charge on this one would be zero. There's no charge. Fluorine, nine, which means my atomic number is nine. My protons are nine, my electrons are nine. 19 is my mass number, given that. So this is gonna be fluorine dash 19. Number of neutrons, 19 minus 9 is 10. Valence electrons, fluorine is in group 17, so 7. Lewis dot structure, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Charge is 0. On this last one, I have 11 protons and 10 electrons, which means this has a charge. So this is plus 1. 11 protons means that this is a sodium ion. It has lost an electron to become a plus one. The symbol is still Na, 2311. Atomic number is still 11, but the only thing that's different is my number of electrons. 23 minus 11 for my neutrons is 12. Valence electrons, still one, even though it has lost that one. Symbol would look like Na. At this point, we are through semester one of CP Chem in two chapters. That is about it. Okay, later.